<laughs> well, hello and good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Professor Cathy Liddell, and I'm the director of the Centre for Law, Medicine and Life Sciences here at the University of Cambridge. And on behalf of our centre and the Cambridge Festival, I am delighted to welcome you to the 2022 Baron Delancey Lecture in Medical Law and Ethics. We are very privileged that our lecture tonight will be given by Professor Bartha Knoppers. And I'm going to take a couple of minutes of your time just to introduce the proceedings, if, if I may. First of all, I'd like to say that we're very fortunate and grateful that the lecture series is uh, supported uh, by the university's Verheyden Delancey Fund, uh, which uh, supports medical law research and teaching. The fund was bestowed by a foundation in Jersey that was set up in 1970 in, in memory of the uh, quite extraordinary Baron Delancey, who was a uh, medic, a lawyer, and a financier, amongst many other things. Uh, following in his uh, footsteps, the lecture series has a long history of distinguished interdisciplinary speakers, and we're going to add to that tonight. Uh, Professor Knoppers is going to discuss whether the law appropriately regulates uh, regenerative medical technology and whether international law might play a role in uh, securing or maintaining that balance. We're delighted that Professor Knoppers has agreed to give this lecture because she's a um, highly distinguished professor from uh, McGill University in Canada, where she founded the Center for Genomics and Policy, which has led its field for two decades. And in the area of tonight's talk in regenerative medicine, uh, she has chaired the uh, policy committee of the Canadian Stem Cell Network, as well as the ethics working party of the International Stem Cell Forum. She has served on the International Commission on the Clinical Use of Human Germline Genome Editing, and also currently co-chairs the ethics working group of the uh, Human Stem Cell Atlas. In recognition of this work and, and much more, she holds no less than four honorary doctorates, as well as the Order of Canada and fellowships with uh, leading medical societies and the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Canadian Bioethics Society. In short, uh, I think uh, she's made a, a truly inspirational contribution to bioethics and law. And I think you'll agree with me that she's a um, outstanding person to be giving tonight's lecture. Uh, just before I hand over to you, Bartha, I just have one or two logistics uh, to run through. The lecture is being uh, simultaneously uh, live streamed through the web for those of us who cannot be here in person. And after the presentation, we will have a Q&A session until around about uh, quarter to seven, no later than quarter to seven. For those of you who are watching online, uh, the chat function will um, have been disabled, but you can pose questions to participate in the Q&A session uh, using the Q&A icon in the toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom screens. Uh, your questions will be collated by the organizers for the live uh, Q&A. And you can also give a thumbs up to the questions that you would particularly like to hear answered. And maybe we should uh, introduce that to <laughs> the setting here too. Um, right, so uh, with that, I'd like to invite you uh, to join me in welcoming in the customary way, Professor Bartha Knoppers. Thank you, Professor Little. Um, what Kathy left out in her introduction is that um, I'm here with my husband, who's a professor of international law. His name is Daniel Chirp. And we actually had our first child here in Cambridge. We were working on our doctorates from France, but we decided to supplement with a diplomas from um, the various colleges here, he, Queens, and myself, Trinity. So when I was checking out Le Baron, <laughs> I noticed that he also um, had Dutch origins, which is interesting because I was born in the Netherlands, and that he was from Trinity. So I immediately felt an affinity 
uh, for the Baron de Lancy. And I think Verheyen, if I'm not mistaken, that Veronica must be part of that family as well. She's a top European geneticist. So I'm really pleased to be here. I've worked with the um, Center for Medicine Ethics and Life Sciences. I've worked with uh, Ron Zimmern from the PhD Foundation. So whenever we come to Cambridge, it really is like coming home. So thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Foundation as well. I don't care read a newspapers anymore because every time I think, oh, you have to be, you know, topical and timely and, but then there's too much. Uh, I'll just take this morning. Oh no, first yesterday, three, three billion into the Altos labs here in Cambridge from Jeff Bezos uh, for uh, work combining immuno immunology with cell line, cell therapy and gene therapy. Um, there was a parthenogenesis sort of news yesterday, again, from a lab here in Cambridge. And then this morning, uh, we saw that in, an indigenous nation has sued on behalf of the salmon's right to life, uh, saying that the salmon have an inherent right to exist, flourish, regenerate, and evolve. And I think there was also, unfortunately, the death of the um, first person to receive a pig's heart transplant. Now we know there was baby Faye in 1984, but this was the, and it wasn't from a rejection. So this, this Zeno actually uh, worked. They had used CRISPR uh, to engineer the uh, pig's organ to be compatible with the recipient. It was actually that, um, I think the poor man was just uh, worn out from his, from his condition. So when you're in a field like this, um, you don't always want to read the news because you don't want to always have to have things to think about. But it is exciting because when I was here in um, 1979, um, Steptoe and Edwards were here and they graciously offered me a lowly PhD student, having come from France where, you know, professors are way up there. I, I, I was, could interview them. And my thesis was on IVF at that time, which was just emerging and Louise Brown had been born in 1978. And so we didn't know, nobody knew what should we intervene at all, how, if so, why. And I was so struck as a professor still today about how important it is to give time to your students and, and to make them dream that they can address important um, issues. So that was IVF. But then um, in, in, in today's context, we've sort of come back around in the um, 1990s, the Human Genome Project sort of took over from the fantastical slippery slope world of IVF. And so it was map the human genome, map the human genome. I was very involved in that because it was one of the first projects that believed in data sharing and every 24 hours downloading uh, whatever sequences had been found into an open repository. At the same time, there was Solera, the company, which Craig Ventner saying, join us, we'll do it for you. We'll even pay to do it for you, but we get the IP. So we had these two projects in competition to sequence the human genome. And since then, we've been trying to understand what the map says to us. But today in 2022, we're, we're, we're back into more of the, pardon expression, creationist um, uh, issues of tissue engineering and, and gene editing and modifying and implanting and reprogramming and CRISPR editing and so on. So now back like three, four decades later, while knowing life and the value of knowledge stood at the center of the Human Genome Project, today it is the making and engineering of life that more and more defines biolegality in the present time. But luckily uh, we've learned that today's fields are not singular disciplines and that includes law, by the way, and includes ethics and sociology and psychology and so on. And regenerative medicine is one of the fields that really stands out as per se um, a multidisciplinary field that combines knowledge and technologies from different fields. And look at the list there uh, to develop therapies, 
products for repair, replacement, damaged tissues, organs. Why don't you add CRISPR editing future generations and so on to, to the list? But lessons learned from 40 years, from IVF to human genome to regenerative medicine, is not just because the field is multidisciplinary, but we've realized that we need to contextualize, we need to look at the genome in terms of the environment, in terms of epigenetics. We've seen that the relationship between animals and humans and the, the code of one or I think, is it the yeast? Is there a geneticist in the audience? I think the yeast genome is the closest to the human genome. That's what's very humbling. And, and so we realize this interconnection between the different contexts of um, animals, the environment um, and humans and have begun to think beyond um, singular fields and uh, disciplines and also be between persons versus thing and so on. So the aim then of today's um, uh, presentation is, is also to show you again by way of introduction that there's not a legal vacuum. There's not an ethics vacuum. There's not a policy vacuum. This is the list of tools that the WHO Advisory Committee just came out with in July 2021 that already, when put together, when understood, when examined and so on, shows that we are dealing with it, if I can put it that way. Albeit it looks truncated, it looks like it's already passe, but we have many, many tools at our disposition and we don't always have to have a law against it or a law to limit it and so on. And there's many, many activities and interventions that serve um, to guide us across and around the world in our different cultures and our different countries. So my aim today then, and I must say, I think you saw his name on the first slide, I uh, collaborate with a PhD student of mine, um, Michael Beauvais, and we have a common love for art, but he's the only one who, who can check out whether I'm allowed to use the art I wanna use for the Creative Commons licensing and all this stuff, but he should get the credit for the choice of the uh, slides you'll see. So I'm gonna start by looking at, okay, what does the law say about you know, person, thing, animal, human, and so on? What has the professional community done in terms of saying, if it's a serious condition, then maybe you can go ahead with mitochondrial this, or maybe you can go ahead with gene editing, or maybe you can do prenatal and so on. But what about the future? Is, it, is that filter, that professional filter sufficient? And finally, um, are there any, as Kathy mentioned, international uh, solutions that we should be looking at? So to date, just by way of um, the dualisms, you will see that's mainly the courts that have sort of had to decide what's property or not, or what's uh, animal or human and so on. And it's mainly the professional associations that have looked at what is a serious condition, what is severe enough to merit giving access to prenatal or preimplantation or mitochondrial and so on. And finally, for the future, does human rights hold the promise and, and the strength um, to deal with our um, dynamic, uh, um, re-engineered, reprogrammed futures? So in December of 2019, another legal scholar, um, Hank Greeley and I uh, published in Science, uh, 2000 word, I say this because anybody who thinks, well, most of you must know, I think this was 18 versions of this article uh, without making sure the editors didn't say what they wanted to say instead of what we wanted to say. But we tried to look through the traditional dualisms in law that, that help us sort of circumscribe and frame and filter and allow or not allow um, certain um, technology. So this is more how you define human to know uh, what law applies. And so we looked at um, obviously the prenatal and IVF and so on that have been around since the 70s, but the pre-implantation genetic testing, which kind of removes it from 
decisions made during pregnancy and all the other um, legal rights that go with reproduction. Uh, induced pluripotent stem cells, uh, programming one way, reprogramming that way, going back to the original and then reprogramming another way. Sheaf's brain activity in, 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 in pigs, chimeras, as we heard about animal organs into humans, and organoids. Organoids sort of serve as avatars. You can actually create next to the patient using their cells. It's already be used in cancer. This is not a movie thing. Um, uh, the, using the patient's own cells and tissues, a model for testing your drugs and so on without inf uh, um, actually uh, inflicting anything on the patient, uh, him or herself. So how do we define human? And we have to make sure that just because someone is seen or understood in a particular country as being human doesn't necessarily mean they're a legal person. So that's why when you see human beings, it's an elastic term that permits different countries to sign universal declarations of human rights without in any way being limited by a social, cultural, or religious or other um, constraints. So maxim of Roman law, I had to add women because of course it was up there. Law is supposed to be for the benefit of um, humans, men and uh, women. But traditionally, there were two classical categories. You were either a person or a thing. A thing can be owned, a thing can be sold. So you can see why it's very important in the prohibition against slavery or selling organs to make these kinds of uh, distinctions. But more importantly, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. So if you're recognized as a human being in dignity, which is inherent, you can ascribe in your particular society or hopefully internationally, human rights. People sometimes make lists and they put dignity, security, privacy, it's not the same. Dignity is not a human right. Dignity is inherent, it's in what um, defines us as humans and allows us then to uh, uh, ascribe uh, human rights to respect that inherent dignity. So what about these um, dualisms? As first year professor, unfortunately, I was telling Kathy this the other day, I started, uh, I guess, 95, and they said, we always, always give property law to first year professors. Like, what? I don't know anything about property law. I don't own anything. Uh, courses start in six weeks. What do you mean I have to teach property law? I don't even want to want to know about property law. Well, actually, it turned out to be quite handy for learning about um, the limits of property law, but also today about how, like with the vaccine issues around IP and uh, open licensing and so on, it's, it's good to have a handle on it, though I must say, I'm not even sure today that I, uh, but I got the highest ratings for the subject I knew the least about. <laughs> I don't know what that says about professors, but it's, it's exactly what happened. Uh, maybe I wasn't complicated. And so person thing, human animal, living dead, personal, or anonymous or anonymized. And finally, this other subject is not a legal dualism. It's a subject of last year's lecture, if I remember right. You had enhancement and therapy in sports and, and, and so on. So I put it up there just to remind you of, of last year. So what are these uh, dualisms and, and, and have they really had any impact on, on do they serve um, society by allowing some sort of certitude, is that French probably certainty, uh, in, in terms of how we define and handle uh, potential conflicts or issues? I've got two Canadian cases here. Um, don't worry, this is not a sperm warehouse. <laughs> it's only a picture that shows you that if you can't find a law in something, you work by analogy. You find uh, a, a, a part of the law or, uh, that actually by analogy would allow you to determine the rights of the parties involved simply because it seems to be the same kind of situation. So they, in this case, they use the Warehouse Receipt Act 
I'm sure they could have used dry cleaning, you know, the law governing dry cleaning contracts or whatever. But you can see how the courts then are forced to take existing laws that weren't meant for, you know, who owns the sperm, who can get the sperm, what happens when the warehouse burns down or whatever. And here they said sperm could be considered, frozen sperm could be considered property. So that's one province in Canada. Then you have Ontario, another province in Canada, both common law, though not civil law. Common, and here in 2019, the Ontario Court of Appeal um, overturned a uh, lower court decision saying that it's the contract that decides. When you go to a fertility clinic, and I've written these, these, these contracts, when you go to a fertility clinic, put everything down, should I die, should I divorce, should I, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it normally you would think that the contract would govern what the parties could or could not do with the frozen <clears throat> embryos following uh, a dispute or death or separation or whatever. Court of Appeal said, no, 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 neither contract nor property. You can see why they didn't want to get into that. Um, we have a law in Canada, and it has regulations saying it's a consent. And so um, it's a consent model, a person, personal autonomy model that decides what was the consent of the parties, not the contract. So now uh, that law in and of itself uh, was in part struck down uh, Canadians like Australians, like Germans, and so on. Health is a provincial matter, state matter, whatever. So we had to use the criminal code in order to have a national, a national approach to reproductive technologies. And in that national approach, we could condemn criminally uh, commercial reproductive surrogacy, human reproductive cloning. All the provinces agreed. But then there was sort of like mission creep and uh, they got into what would be health in, in, in the provinces. And so part of the law uh, had been already uh, struck down. Species uh, identity, uh, animal, human. This is probably, and I know I'm in Cambridge and I think animal, the animal human um, divide of the classical divide is probably the most contentious uh, right now. And every time you think, oh, well, people are gonna be against it. They're gonna be against Zeno. They're gonna be against chimeras. They're gonna be against, when you ask them, oh, you're quite surprised at, uh, for instance, the first article um, from the United States that 59% of the US public can personally accept the process of injecting human-induced pluripotent stem cells into genetically modified swine embryos and having human tissues produced in a pig's body transplanted into human. That's the United States. I'm thinking, wow, um, which is usually very conservative, but their organs, their tissues, it's medical. They think it's going to be um, uh, therapeutic and helpful. And similarly, in Japan, another country that's known for its uh, uh, quite uh, narrow approach to uh, genetics and um, to new um, technologies. But this is the one that I think um, not only typifies and symbolizes, but in a way is, is like an attractor in physics. It, it really centers uh, uh, the attention of the public. And habeas corpus, as you know, um, goes back to the Magna Carta and, and, and was used to say, get these chimpanzees out of their cages. We have a right to see if they are alive. Imagine using the writ of habeas corpus. And finally, the judge says, okay, um, it's arguable that a chimpanzee is not a person, but there's no doubt that it's not merely a thing. Then last week in Switzerland, in the canton of Basel, uh, they voted down a um, referendum on whether chimps had the right to life. But this week, has it gone through? Does anybody know? I keep checking the papers. Did this bill go through here in your um, animal welfare uh, bill that you had about animals being sentient beings? That doesn't mean they're persons but they get a special status. 
And this has happened in Quebec as well, where you give them a, a, a status that protects them while saying that they're not human or that they're not just simple property that you can destroy and exploit and, and harm and so on. I think this is the one that was supposed to go through um, here in the UK uh, this week. But while we're into, you know, what's animal, what's human, what about all the, the zappers and the buzzers and all the neuro, uh, um, I'm thinking when Christian Barnard, I think it was in the 70s when he did his first transplant and everyone was so upset saying the heart was the locus of the soul. And then we sort of gave up on that one. And now we thought, that, well, the brain is what distinguishes us from other um from other species? Is it the fact that, okay, animals may be sentient, but is it the fact that we can reflect on our own existence that defines us um, as, as human? And, um, or the fact that we can project into the future and so on. Because we know that elephants, for instance, can and do hold funerals. Uh, so they recognize death. So we're, you know, we're always on this, this borderline. But then the organoids that have been used because um, you obviously don't want to intervene too much in the human brain, now as avatars are being questioned as to the ethics of um, creating uh, such entities to, to uh, work on um, and spare humans from um, such invasive kind of surgery. And the final one then is the, um, the living uh, and uh, the dead. Well, the second to last one is living and uh, the dead. And if you remember way back in the 17th, 16th century and so on, you were alive if you could, if a mirror was clouded, right? So whether you were being, whether you were just born or whether you were dying or dead. It was now, of course, viability is, is machine or technologically determined. So those kind of criteria um, are not no longer available. But they um, have been since even Roman law, respect for even when you're no longer a person because you're dead, or even when you're becoming a person because you're a fetus, but you're not a person yet, but you're a human being, but no. And we have, um, grave robbing statutes since the medieval times, respect for the body after death. We have protection uh, for fetuses in quotes that are born alive for their inheritance rights and so on. So there have always been uh, uh, tools in the law uh, to ensure, uh, and even in Quebec, if, 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 um, if there's a car accident, a negligent driver and the woman uh, loses a fetus of over 500 grams. Incredible. Uh, you have to, yeah. uh, anyway, she loses a fetus of 500 grams. She will be compensated the statutory amount, not because it's a person, but in recognition of the loss uh, and so on. <clears throat> so then that brings us to data, which seems to be the new identity, if I can put it that way, as opposed to physiological sense. And when are you a non-person uh, uh, as far as data protection law goes? Well, the general data protection regulation, the GDPR, which no one likes, but everyone's adopting because it's the European and it's having a great influence on research that can or cannot be done and data that can or cannot be shared, says you're not a person for data protection if you're anonymous or you've been rendered anonymous via de-identification technologies, nor does it apply to deceased persons. So I think that's pretty, that's pretty clear. And it has an, what we call in law, an extraterritorial effect. We didn't adopt it in Canada, nor the United States, but you cannot work with anyone, whether commercially or research wise or whatever, you're all under the reach of the GDPR. So what has happened to date in, 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 in terms of what do we do with these dualisms? Well, there's all this wiggle. I don't know if it's wiggle or wiggle, but the courts, the um, uh, 
research ethics bodies uh, of all sort of fudged around by finding expressions that have existed in law for quite a long time that serve to help them if you, in a particular situation, define who's a person, a thing, an animal, uh, and so on. And you can see here, uh, essentially equivalent, for instance, if you want to send data to Canada, you have to see if our protection laws are adequate. What does that mean? Either you have a ruling from the European Data Protection Board, or uh, they have said, yes, you're adequate, or you actually say in your contract, in contractual clauses, we are essentially equivalent in our level of protection and so on. So these are the um, ones that were used in almost all the cases of embryos, uh, of um, uh, use of organs after death, and, and um, obviously for negligence, obviously for criminal law, and so on, um, in terms of, of giving uh, that kind of flexibility to the courts to adjust to the issues at hand. But we're moving away from sort of the person, the autonomy, the expression of autonomy, uh, to considering the social environment, including autonomy at a group level, in order to meet social obligations to contribute to both greater knowledge and efforts to reduce social inequity. And I think the COVID um, crisis and the need to share data, the need to get the data, uh, here you were the only country in the world where researchers could get access to clinical records, albeit a limited number of data fields, not, not the whole record over time, to, to be able to follow the clinical expression of the virus. Whereas everywhere else, we had to get an informed, explicit, written consent. Most people had died by then, and, and or the next of kin were too upset, and, 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 or they couldn't sign, and et cetera. And, and, and so how at a group level, how at an international level can we respect autonomy and at the same time um, consider our social obligations um, to contribute to uh, greater knowledge and reduce social inequities? So if the human is unique, but we know it's not just biologically unique, but also socially uh, contextualized, the vagueness in law does allow it's a deliberate vagueness and probably um, the best tool for um, uh, settling uh, these uh, disputes. But as we know, professionals in the field faced with real life situations aren't gonna wait for the courts. So what have they developed then to allow them to, to what can or cannot go through? Now, severity has always been a clinical, medical, scientific uh, determination, and the criteria are um, uh, right there. And we've used it since prenatal, access to new technologies, and so on. But way back when, in 2001, Dorothy Words and I went and surveyed American Society of Genetics, European Society of Genetics, Canadian Society of Genetics, and South American. What is severe? And we only asked medical geneticists in practice. And look at that, 51 disorders across all the disorders were simultaneously listed as either lethal, serious, or not serious. So even in the profession, and you think, well, wait a minute, did everybody get, you know, go to school? Did they all get their degrees? Most of this has to do with the fact that your determination is what the laws in your country say about reproductive health, access to abortion, prenatal diagnosis, and so on. And so you could deliberately class, classify or whatever it is in English, um, uh, uh, your condition dependent, of course, on the norms of the country where you were as opposed to um, purely scientific norms. And more recently, um, the American College of Medical Geneticists has actually started listing genes. What do you do 
if you're doing whole genome sequencing or whole exome sequencing, and you see stuff you're not testing for, but you see it because you're doing whole genome and whole exome. Uh, do you say nothing and, and, and wait till somebody comes and says, how come you never told me or why? Are you? So they have now every year come out since 2013 with a list of genes that laboratories should report to physicians. These are very, in quotes, serious uh, conditions to stabilize and create an even playing field, if I can put it that way, and as to what patients should receive and what physicians will receive and should communicate. But there's national academies that still use this prevent a serious disease, uh, oversight to prevent uses other than serious. Um, Quebec, you could one day maybe do human germline genome modification for very serious high penetrance diseases and so on, even in Germany. Uh, one day there may be germline to avoid serious monogenic hereditary diseases. And I think there's one country that's changed the most in the last 10 years and in, in, uh, in terms of their attitudes towards genetic research, it's probably uh, Germany. Now your own act used serious for testing, licensing, mitochondrial, without having a definition, which is probably a good thing. But you do have codes of practice, which give some indicators to physicians and so on as to what they should take into account. And what about the, the, the future child that will be born and so on? And the mutation, the inherit is it inheritance and so on? What if there's no treatment? Or what if there's only treatment, but it costs so much that you have to go into a lottery, like for SMA, that drug for... Uh, 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 um, for the uh, spinal uh, muscular atrophy. The International Commission, uh, I was a part of this, I must say I really sort of grow up in these, these things, um, said if one day heritable human genome editing were to be scientifically safe and effective and the preclinical data looked promising, even so, even so, it would be limited to serious monogenic conditions. And only for those for whom there are no other options. Because remember, there is pre-implantation selection possible. And this definition took three months of work of a commission to come to severe morbidity or uh, premature death. And, and, and so um, here is a... Um, screening panel for 176 genes and classification of severity for uh, carrier screening. What do we do? What do we do? And you can see the kind of tools that we're building um, for physicians in these situations. But they're objective and they're not necessarily contextual or how people see their condition. So in a study that just came out on expanding prenatal, uh, myself and another author said, well, you can create lists. That's kind of dangerous. What if one day you have a list and someone's born with that condition and prenatal was available for free democratically in the universal healthcare system and um, wasn't offered or was refused? As you know, we have... Um, children who will either, or their parents and or partners will sue for wrongful birth, wrongful life, wrongful conception, and so on. And what do we do about the actual context of these uh, couples and their child-to-be? This was fascinating. Why don't we ask the people who have these conditions? Let's, <laughs> and, and yes, um, I should have put it in yellow, but in the middle there, you'll see that the majority of participants reported good health, well-being, and capacity for quality of life, despite experiencing suffering with their condition. Notably, however, patients with later onset conditions held more negative views of their health and quality of life, and were more likely to view their condition as an illness than those with early onset who had lived with their condition. Interesting. Same, ask the citizens, ask the general public. <coughs> um, again, in the middle of the um, uh, quote there, 
The results showed that the multifactorial aspects that participants considered as, considered as relevant for evaluating severity were similar to those used by the professionals. Well, that's a comfort. I mean, there seems to be some sort of convergence on what these um, other criteria uh, uh, should be. And, and so findings such as in our study could have the potential to strengthen the internal legitimacy among professionals. So what does this mean then for the, uh, uh, the second part of this uh, talk about uh, taking seriousness seriously? It's subjective. It's contextual, uncertain, and changeable. So I don't think we should get a definition of what is serious in spite of the um, work of the uh, International Commission, but it has to stay as sort of a, a filter, a framing, a beginning of a discussion uh, and not get lost in a series of checklists, taxonomies and algorithms and so on. And, and, and we have to build that sort of framework for that discussion. And one way that I think we can move out of social cultural uh, differences and also medical tourism, because what you can't get diagnosed in one country or treated in one country, if you have the means, you can find a country that will offer those technologies. So we really need to have a different approach than solely national interventions, which represent social cultural norms of a particular a country. And I would argue that using a, a human rights approach moves us to another level of discussion. And this is the first article of the uh, UNESCO 1997 Universal Declaration. And that it's, it's appartenance or a belonging to the human family that distinguishes from animals and things. And the inherent dignity of the human and yet the diversity uh, inside the human family. And there's an expression here at the end that belongs to public international law, which I won't go into, that is like the sea, like the sky, the human genome at the level of the species is the uh, common heritage of humanity. So in conclusion to the second part, I will now argue in my third uh, part that the um, series is just the beginning. So if serious is both medical, scientific, and contextual and personal, to bring it to the next level of, of having some common discussion, at least, maybe not consensus, on um, the principles for responsible scientific and technological uh, advances, I, because the values are universal, might be the way to move forward. And I think CRISPR and gene editing Somatic for the time being with quite a bit of success, by the way, and perhaps one day germline is where we need to get our act together on um, human rights approach. If so, um, we know already about the inequalities that genetics, the genetic lottery um, brings to, to, to humans, to human life. But we also have not discussed what inequalities that the genetic revolution could help us mitigate. So we could develop an account of justice that takes seriously not only individual rights, but also the potential health benefits of attending to the evolutionary causes of morbidity and disability. There you see Eleanor Roosevelt and um, different, it's funny that we're discussing this at a time when human rights are in great, apparel um, in the last two weeks or so and totally disavowed, uh, ignored and um, run over in every sense of the word. But there, the, the potential is there and following Second World War, the countries did come together and say, let's, let's build a new world order. Let's work on something that we can all agree upon uh, while recognizing national sovereignty, of course. And the advantage of human rights is that they can be um, conjugated, if I can put it that way, together. And they have um, advantages of transparency, proportionality, and recognition of the inherent dignity. If you 
limit yourself to moral arguments, religious arguments, or bioethics arguments you're going to get into schools of thought, to be polite. Whereas there's a universalizing sort of potential and dimension and a, a reality of international legal force uh, for human rights, belonging to groups and not just to individuals, and they impose positive rights, positive duties. So take this Article 15, which is Article 27 in the Universal Declaration. But once it's in a covenant signed and ratified, 171 countries, you can enjoy the benefits. And yet, in the same article, if you are an inventor and you have intellectual creation, you can also have attribution. So it's recognition and attribution. You can have IP and so on. And it can only be limited to such conditions as are determined by law in the general welfare of a democratic society. So that's really powerful. And this is what we call a Cinderella right. It pretty well stayed dormant in 1948. But this International Convention of 1966 started people around, <laughs> scholars around 2009 with the um, Venice Declaration thinking about what this right to science meant. Progress, participation, and benefit. In fact, it could be considered an individual interest in a universal public good. And Professor Yatova, who's sitting here as well tonight um, from Keys, which has kindly uh, uh, received me for this uh, visit, uh, and I wrote about that there was promise in this article for using a global public goods approach. And so we um, came to the conclusion that looking just at data and how this right has been interpreted in the reports that the countries did for the United Nations, how uh, has data and the right of access to data uh, been enabled uh, by different states over time. This right to science also led um, to the constitution and mission of the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, which I won't get into, but using it, saying, no matter where you are, if you want to join this alliance to share genomic and health data, only thing you have to agree to is this framework for responsible sharing. And of course, it, 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 it buttresses, it, it reinforces, it gives energy, if you like, to the right to the highest attainable standard um, of health, including in the um, Convention on the International Rights of the Child. So there's no right to be born healthy, but to the highest attainable standard of health. And that's really important in terms of access issues, um, as we have seen. <clears throat> feeds into the right to science to health and the right to non-discrimination. The duty to make available without discrimination, especially to the most vulnerable, all the best available applications of scientific progress. So in this sense, um, this right then would be taking these three rights together in a way of sort of a, a tool, a, a catalyst for change in terms of the universal human rights that address emerging biotechnologies. And in particular, it shifts away from the individual autonomy, 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 privacy, 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 to a, 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 a broader lens uh, for the sharing of research benefits and, and the limits of state sovereignty. Now there is a case, it's hard to find these kind of cases with in quotes, biotech and human rights. But here's one from 2012, from Costa Rica, where there was a ban, a legal ban on IVF. And the court, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, ordered Costa Rica to provide IVF through state-run clinics in accordance with the principle of non-discrimination. If you're gonna, you cannot offer it at all. But if you're gonna offer it, you have to do it in a uh, non-discriminatory uh, way. And they use the American Declaration on the Rights and Duties of Man and the different articles. Interesting, they have founding a family, which isn't found in every constitution or every declaration as a human right. So to conclude this um, third part, um, 
if we were to take a human rights approach, the advantages are their universality, their flexibility, their legitimacy, and the fact that they are contextual. And we could take the three human rights as well, and I think really have a, a sort of a powerful framework for um, the future of, uh, of regenerative medicine. So in conclusion, maybe I should have added an S on uh, our future for futures. And um, I was inspired in working on this conclusion by this, this book that just came out today, I went to Cambridge University Press. They dug it out of their basement. Um, it's today that the book uh, has been released. And it's a Feschrift in honor of Graham Laurie called Law and Legacy Medical Jurisprudence. And in writing to Graham about, uh, about this book and, and what's he, what is he doing uh, in Edinburgh right now, he said, well, when you're thinking about the future, how vulnerable are we making ourselves with, you know, sort of going on the bandwagon of new biotech, new regenerative medicine? And in particular, in relation to data, he said, uh, we need to think more about how the holding and processing and manipulation and use and deployment of data comes with obligations, not just to actual living persons, but to the future generations. And he said um, in a personal communication again, that um, we should start thinking about the future us and not just, you know, Chinese uh, gene edited uh, twins, but, but beyond the immediate sort of crises. And he said, in a sense, the future versions of ourselves depend on the ways in which our data are or are not used. And so vulnerability is a, is a series of layers, as Florencia Luna said, not labels. And are we making ourselves vulnerable? Are we robbing future generations in advance of their uh, human rights, however defined? And who are or who is the future us? So the scale is international. This is incredible. This is a retina, by the way. I don't know if you can read it at the bottom. It's, um, it's amazing. Uh, anyhow, so the scale is international. And the, the, both the International Commission on Heritable Gene Editing and the WHO said, we need scientific engagement. We need open science. We need policy toolkits, with an S probably. And interestingly said, we need whistleblowing. And so we went running everywhere. What international approaches, laws, covenants, agencies use whistleblowing? Because in the, in the case of the Chinese twins, as you know, there were many, many scientists aware of what was happening, both in China and in the United States. But no one, um, there was no place to go to say anything. And the only place we could find whistleblowing was in the World Anti-Doping Agency, WADA which had set aside and created a special independent whistleblowing office. You can work internationally, hopefully, consensus using human rights, uh, which is more dynamic and more uh, epigenetic and interesting, but you have to have your own house in order, so to speak. So the national level licensing bodies, oversight bodies, funding restrictions, if you don't publish your data, if you don't register what you're doing, you can't get funding, et cetera. And you need public engagement. Well, everybody says that. Let's have public engagement. Well, I went through this and I tell you, <laughs> it's, it's, this is way back in 1989 to 1993, 17 cities every night, uh, every person about 20 minutes, whether they were the top scientist or someone that had a particular thing to say that might have nothing to do with the subject matter to be democratic, of course, we, everybody got 20 minutes. It was, it was, um, it has to be done properly, let's put it this way, there, it was a free-for-all, even though the timing was democratic, the, and everyone got to say what they wanted to say, it, 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 it actually led to, you know, police protection, um, mail being sc screened before you received it, in case you were told you were going to be burned in hell, which happened a lot, by the way. 
uh, and, and so on. So if we do public engagement, how do you do it in an open, transparent and reasonable way where personal or religious or other views, and it was incredible. Sometimes the religious views and the anti-tech or would actually be saying the same, holding the same position. So there's a lot of crossover between, you know, different uh, positions. So if you do this, you have to literally learn from the sociologists and psychologists how to do public engagement in a respectful way, uh, both for the subject matter, but also for the participants that are um, part of it. But there's no doubt that it's um, the need to go towards international uh, governance that is the uh, uh, where the engagement should be. So maybe it should be UNESCO. Maybe it shouldn't be WHO. There are mainly physicians there. Maybe UNESCO is the right place for these kinds of uh, consensus uh, uh, bodies. So here are some of the suggestions about oversight, adherence to principles, uh, a scientific advisory committee to say, this class of science is now safe internationally. Not wait till someone publishes it and then everyone goes, goes haywire. And um, again, the International Commission said we need ongoing evaluation. Have you reached certain milestones? We need debate on new classes of use, democratic debate and accountability mechanisms. Likewise, the WHO came up with a whole series of recommendations, including having a registry Who's doing what, where? Just say what you're doing. You might succeed, you might not succeed. Whistleblowing, they also added it. And they made a particular plea, a subject the commission did not get into, for equitable access and capacity. So some sort of consensus on what do you do with IP. And their registry then um, is there. I don't know, and I can't tell by the number of trials as to um, how effective it is. So if deliberate consensus then is the uh, root of the future, I think we need to sort of, in my last two slides, think about procedural justice, if you like, vis-a-vis -vis future generations, and um, bring some sort of coherence, recognizing that countries are sovereign, that they have their own social, cultural, and so on. But is it the human rights values principles then that can bring that coherence? Can we look at, you know, ecosystems approach and understand that regulations, principles, tools, and so on are not static. They're not standards. Can't believe it when we have discussions on the GDPR. Everyone says, oh, but article so-and-so says such and such. I said, yeah, but you're supposed to interpret it. You're not just supposed to just read it like, you know, uh, it's not a standard. It's, 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 it's uh, a legal um, disposition that can be argued and interpreted relative to the main regulatory objective. So the best piece of news in this very sad last 14 uh, days and so on is that a beautiful piece of work did come out from UNESCO in November, 2021. <laughs> after two years of consultation with all their commissions around the world in different countries who could comment, write in, da, 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 et cetera, on open science. And IP is recognized in there. It's not versus, open versus property stuff. It's really a very well-balanced and, uh, and I think if we are going to take a human rights approach that it has to be uh, one based on, um, following this recommendation and, and the, the text is really something you should all read. But in the meantime, since we're kind of worried about what's human, what's animal, what's thing and, and, and property and so on, don't forget to answer this, which you probably have seen on your computer when you go on into a database or whatever. Don't forget to confirm that you are human. Thank you. Thank you.